All right, so we're on continuing on chapter one. I am peaking a little too high. Anyway, so we've talked about computers, notebooks, tablets. However, we haven't talked about the operating systems yet. All right, most of you are going to be familiar with Windows. All right, even my Mac people in here are probably familiar with using Windows because you go like anywhere, and Windows is like the default go to computer. I don't have the data right now on. Um, what percentage of the market Windows is. Um, but Windows is the one that like everybody uses. Um, and I don't really know why. I don't know if it was the first one or if it was the cheapest one or what the magic word is there. Um, I will say um, that um, it is it will run on the most variety of hardware. And that might be one of the reasons why Windows has won. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to, to think about that. It's like, okay, you know, you look at all the laptops in this room. It's like, you've got a Toshiba, you've got a HP, you've got a Lenovo, you've, you know, you've got all these random brands, but they all still run Windows. And that's probably one of the big reasons that Windows is king when it comes to the, the mass market for, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to specify this as personal computers. All right. For desktops or laptops that you guys are using, Windows is going to be the go-to. Does that mean it's the best? No. All right, um, you're, my Mac people in here, you're like Max rule, screw PCs, throw those out the window. I can't, I can't say anything that bad about a Macintosh. All right, um, my biggest complaint about anything Apple is price. So if I look at the price, the performance of a Mac versus the performance of a PC, the Mac is always can be equal performance, and the Mac is going to be what like twenty five to fifty to one hundred percent more. And I'm just like, I can't convince myself to go buy a Mac. Um, so that's just personal opinion. But we do have the uh, Macintosh. Oh, actually, I do have some percentages on here. Windows uses about is about seventy percent of the personal computer market. Seventy five percent, three quarters of the market share is a Windows computer. Um, and when you look at like large corporations and things like that, are giving out computers and like again, all these computers are on VDIs, which are Windows. All right, so it's not really that surprising to me that Windows is seventy five percent of that share. Um, it is in the long run pretty simple to use, right? You got a nice GUI interface. All right. I used to complain about Macs not having a right-click option. That always bothered me. Now they have it, so I can't complain about that. So it's really just price. Um, Windows is from Microsoft. If you didn't know that, just like throw that one out there. Windows does also, not Windows, Microsoft does actually have computers they built themselves. All right, it's the Surface and the Surface Pro laptop. There's a laptop version. Anyone know what it is? Go in the link. So there is a laptop that has like a detachable screen too. It's really kind of a weird one. But um, they did make their own hardware. Um, they also tried Windows on ARM-based devices. That was a few years ago that like crapped out on them real quick. And now ARM based Mac is now Apple is based on ARM, and um, at Mac so are like skyrocketing. So it's kind of interesting to see how Windows absolutely failed it and Mac absolutely rocked it. So just kind of interesting there. But anyway, Mac is um, built by Apple. This does run the Mac OS S um, operating system. And the reason that many people favor Macintoshes are because they are secure and stable. Now, yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's really funny to me. If you ever hear people talk about their Macs, they're like, yeah, Macs don't get viruses. It's like, not true. Macs do get viruses. Many years ago, I think back when I was in high school, um, someone put a torrent up of Microsoft Office that had a virus built into it. And because Macs don't have virus scan, <laughs> they when people would illegally download Office and install it on their Mac, they got the virus, which like put a backdoor on their computer and you know streaming all this data to whatever the server was, and the computers got viruses. Now I'm not going to say that's your average user who's going to go illegally download Office with a torrent file, but it did happen, and it was definitely a gaping security hole. So there is viruses out there for Macintoshes. However, if you're going to write a virus for a computer, do you want to write the virus that can affect 75% of computers? Or do you want to write the virus that affects 15%? My money's on the 75% one, right? I'm more likely to get my virus on that computer, get personal information from you that I can use for whatever nefarious purposes that I want. All right. So that is why Windows is the large target vector for viruses. It's because that is where the large population is. All right. You also have all sorts of different virus scan, virus software now for Windows. You've got Windows Defender built in, which I personally find actually okay. I know 
People don't like that Windows Defender is like my go-to. But I also go say, at this point, I'm smart enough to know what I can and can't do on my computer. So I'm perfectly happy with Windows Defender and not having to install extra software on top of it. But there's also McAfee and AVG and a whole bunch of other options out there. Another OS that um, many of you probably have heard of, Chrome OS on Chromebooks. All right. Some people think this is an absolutely worthless operating system. Um, and again, we were talking about netbooks last class and how they were this itty-bitty little computer that all it was really good for was accessing the web browser. And I have to say, we have one Chromebook in my house. I bought it used off of Facebook for, I think it was 50 bucks. It's a 10-inch screen with a touchscreen. And for the most part, it perfect. It gets what I need done for it. My wife is happy to use it. My daughter loves using it because she can play her games on it like it's an Android tablet. Um, but it has a full keyboard. So it really gets the job done for me. It's like the perfect little laptop just to throw in a bag and just not care about. Um, to the point was like after a week of owning, I'm like, maybe I should buy another one of these. <laughs> like that exact model. I like the touch screen. I like the all. And I like the $50 price point. And there was still somewhere out there on eBay. But um, but yeah, so it gets the job done, for what, depending on your needs. Um, but the battery life on a Chromebook is going to be way beyond that of a Windows or even a Mac laptop. So that is a big benefit of that Chromebook. Um, and many of them now also are charging up USB-C, which is really nice. So you got one cell phone charger, one charge that charges your Chromebook and your, your phone. So that's kind of nice. I think Macs are charging up USB-C now, too. Um, they, some of them might have MagSafe nowadays. I think that's starting to come back. But... Um, and then the last one, which this is going to be the one that many of you probably haven't heard about, is Linux. All right. Linux is an open source operating system. It is many of the versions of it. There are tons and tons and tons and tons of different versions of it. Are free for you to download at home. You can install them on your own devices and run them. And most of them work beautifully. All right. um, you know how Windows now has the App Store? Linux has had an App Store for years. Like, I don't know how long, but back when I was in high school, they had an App Store already. So. Linux was like ahead of the game on that aspect of things. Um, so it's kind of nice. Um, it's definitely something fun to play around with just to like experience. Um, very few people that I know of daily drive it, um, except for one of my students. Their husband works for Red Hat. Found that out yesterday. Um, and he's been using Linux since like, you know, he's in his 20s. So um, their whole household is Linux, except for their two kids or their, their kids um, gaming laptops because... Gaming on Linux is just not there yet. It's getting better. We're, we're approaching a point of being acceptable and it working well, but it's still not quite there yet. So um, it's kind of interesting. Um, however, where Linux is used drastically. Oh, so Linux on the PC market, 5%. Chrome, 2 to 3%. Well, however, where Linux is used the majority, and we're talking like 93% is what the data I saw yesterday was, um, was on the top 100,000 servers out there. <laughs> so like when you go to Amazon, that is a Linux server that you are accessing. Um, here on campus, I would almost put fat money on the fact that these VDIs are all accessing a Linux virtual desktop interface server. Don't actually know that for sure, but I'd put money on it. Um, my house, I actually have a Linux server running. That's my backbone for my, my home automation and things like that. So Linux is my go-to. And the reason Linux is nice for the server side is it's low overhead. All right. You've got Windows, and it's like, oh, I've got all this crap going on. It Well, Linux is just like, here's the bare bones. Install what you actually need. Not, oh, I go to Home Depot. Home, Home Depot. I go to Best Buy, and I buy a laptop from Lenovo. And it's, you got all this Lenovo crap on there. It's like, oh, it's already got McAfee pre-installed. It's like, I don't have a license for McAfee. Why is that pre-installed on my laptop? Now I have to go uninstall it. Um, one of the first things I like to do if I actually go buy a brand new laptop is just delete everything and reinstall Windows just to get rid of all the crap that came with it because there is so much of it that it comes on Windows computers. <laughs> like I don't want all the bloatware. Just go away and I just wipe it, do a fresh install, and then I'm much happier. So, um, but Linux said um, mainly used for servers. Um, it's it's really kind of surprising how much of the world actually runs on Linux. Um, I, we, we do actually have a Linux class, which is CSC 109. Um, for those of you who are in the computer science field, you will probably be taking that at some point. And you might get your, your lovely teacher here, so I might get to at least read your stuff again, because it's normally online. Um, and there also is a Microsoft Windows class. Uh, I don't remember what, what that class number is, but we do have one of those as well. It's talking and dealing with like settings and all sorts of wonderful things. So, um, But anyway, so Linux is a very useful tool. Is it the best tool in the world? Not for everybody, all right? 
it is not quite streamlined yet. Um, and it is open source, which means that the forum community members are the people who are helping you, which is lovely. Except for you're like, all right, I have this problem. You search it. You're like, boom, there. That's the problem right there. You read the forum. You're like, okay, I need to do this. You type the commands in and it's like, that didn't fix it. It's like, oh, someone else said I should try this. And you do that. That didn't fix it. It's like, there's you know 10,000 answers to a one problem. And depending on the version of the operating system and what version of the software you're installing, you know, there's different fixes and everything gets tweaked. And that's the problem. It is so configurable that it is just a pain for people who aren't super tech savvy. Um, now, how many of you guys use Android phones? Wow, that's it. You're running Android, or you're running Linux, sorry. Android is actually Linux, just so you, for those who are curious. Um, Chrome OS is also based off Linux. All right, so some other personal computing devices. Smartphones, we've already hit those up, right? You all have them. The big winners right now are Android and iPhone, all right? Some people are calling that a duopoly because there's only two providers out there and they've locked you in, all right? Um, do anyone in here play Fortnite? Oh, nobody. Okay. Well, Fortnite has gone to battle with um, Apple and Google saying, you're a duopoly. I want to be able to install my software my way. I don't want to pay your your app store tax of 15% or whatever the magic number is of every penny that I, you know, someone buys in my app and yada, yada, yada. Um, so, yeah. It's the way the game works. But anyway, um, smartphones combine personal computing power with cellular connection. All right. Obviously, if you have inter if you have a cellular connection, you can access the internet on them. If you have a data plan. All right. Most people I know have a data plan on their cell phone anymore. Um, I can remember back way back when, when I got my first cell phone, that nice brick Nokia cell phone all i had was phone i didn't even have texting <laughs> all right and i remember i went to college and my mother's like you guys are missing out on not having texting so she added texting to it for my brothers and i um and then i don't know what happened i don't remember why but we all said then we had data it's like oh that's kind of nice okay and so now we are where we are now so we've got data on our phones which is nice um you do have lots of apps all right well, obviously we have the app store we have the apple app store we have the google app store Apple does not let you sideload apps, all right? Which means if there is an app that you want that Apple's like, no, 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 that does not meet our regulations, you can't install it. You don't even have the option, all right? However, Google will let you sideload apps. In fact, there are multiple app stores on Android devices. You have the two big ones are Amazon and Google's. So there are two big app stores, and there are other ones after that as well. Um, but even so, if it's not on the Google or the Amazon App Store and you want that on your phone, you know, you find the magical APK file on the internet and you're like, this looks like a great app. And hopefully it's not all viruses. <laughs> you can go through your settings, disable checkbox, and then you can install it on your phone and use the app as you've seen fit. So that is, to me, a big benefit of the Android app system. Um, also, you, traditionally, your phones are going to have cameras in them. Um, I couldn't tell you the last cell phone I saw that didn't have a camera on it. <laughs> All uh, right, it's been years since I had a phone that had a camera on it. The last time I used a phone without a camera was back when I was in grad school, and I broke my phone. And I went back to a candy bar phone for like a week or two while I got my new phone shipped to me. And it was actually kind of freeing, not having, A, the giant smartphone in my pocket, because the phone that I had was only like one inch by like, I mean, it was like that big. <laughs> And only like that thick. <laughs> like I lost it in my pocket. I'm like, do I have my phone with me? I did one of these. And I didn't feel it. So I actually had to like stick my hand in. I was like, oh, there it is. Okay. I have my phone with me. Um, and it was just, it was kind of freeing to like not have all the emails and everything else coming to my phone. Didn't really text on it because it was T9 and I was horrible at that. So I was just kind of like, oh, okay. Just, just a phone. Like how many of you guys have ever left your house without your phone? Like you forgot it at home or the battery was completely dead. Isn't that one of like the best days in the world? You're just like, no worries, people can't contact me, you know, it's just I know my schedule, I gotta go from here to here to there, you know, whatever the case is. It's so freeing just to be like, forgot my phone. Here, everyone else might be pissed off at you for not having your phone. You're like, I tried to contact you. I it's like, sorry, phone was dead. <laughs> can't help it. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> All right. Um, but anyway. Next we have e-readers. Anyone have a Kindle or another e-ink device? One person, I have one, two, two, all right. Um, if you do a lot of reading, e-readers are absolutely wonderful devices, um, especially for travel purposes, all right? Because it's like, okay, I'm going to go on a two-week vacation, you know, whatever. 
if you're lucky enough to go on a two week vacation, I applaud you. All right. Um, but it's like, okay, I need to take some books with me to read on the airplane and while we're driving and whatever else the case. And, you know, it's like, okay, I've got a whole backpack just full of books to go on a two week vacation. Or you can buy a Kindle or whatever other you want. I think it's a Kobo up on the screen, it's not positive. Um, and you can load, you know, 20 books on that and it's all of about the size of your cell phone, maybe a little bigger. But the real benefit of the e-readers e are the screen, all right? You're not having a backlit screen, which is actually really bad for your eyes, all right? It actually looks like you're reading a paper. Um, it's, it looks like someone has drawn ink on your screen, like that, that type of thing. It is nice. Um, the newer Kindles are what they call edge lit. They're not backlit, which I guess is supposed to be better for your eyes. I don't know how true that is, but it is. Um, I actually prefer my older Kindle over my wife's newer Kindle. I still have buttons. I have physical buttons to turn the page. I don't have to tap the damn screen. It's so much nicer. It's like, okay, just hit the button. I know where I hit. You know, it's not like, oh, if you click in this section of the screen, which we don't tell you where it is normally, it goes forward. This one goes backward. This one brings up a menu. And it's, it's just like you have to remember that there's this magical line on the screen that above this is the menu system. <laughs> so I really like my actual buttons better. But the e-ink screens are they're so nice. Um, I've done my fair share of reading on an iPad, and I did the inverted. So I made the text white and the screen black to try to bring the screen brightness down some. It does not compare to an e-ink screen. So highly suggest that for any reading that you're going to do. Um, the other benefit of that is the e-ink screens use basically zero power when you're not changing the screen. So it's, it would be like me turning the projector on, painting the screen, and turning the projector off and saying, it's, you know, it just sits there. It just hangs out. It is physically not, basically using no power. So it's, um, I think Kindles used to be rated in page turns. It wasn't hours, it wasn't days. It was like, you can turn 3,000 pages on a, on a battery cycle, something like that. Um, which to me is just really impressive. So it's kind of nice in that aspect. Uh, yeah. Downside to ink screens, traditionally, no colors. Black and white and you have gradients, but you don't have like red or green or blue. You know, you don't really get that. They are working on that technology and there are some devices out there that do have that capability built into them, but not all that often. Um, I don't, don't know when we're going to get there. It'll be interesting. Um, there were some companies, I think at one point, that were like having e-ink screens on the top of their laptops. So you could go into like a super low power mode and like read a website or something on it instead of having a normal laptop screen up. But don't know what ever happened to those. GPSs, which we've talked about kind of earlier already. Um, global positioning systems. Um, ideally, it'd be this own little, nice little, you know, separate device. But basically, we all just have it in our phones nowadays. And I already asked you guys how many have a GPS in your car, and everyone basically said nope. And I was like, I do, because remember, there's no when there's no internet, and you're like, Google direct me, and it's like, can't do that. Yep, we're up a creek. So, um, yeah, and this is done through triangulation. Now, the really to me, one of the interesting things about how GPS actually works. So we've got satellites overhead, right? They're flying through the hand. Global positioning um, satellites or system, um, and what they are actually doing is they're broadcasting what time they sent their message. And like, so this is satellite 32 sending at, you know, 22 and it's down to the nanosecond, like transmit. And then we take that information from all these different satellites. And by knowing what time they sent and what time it is currently, we're able to determine how far that satellite is away from us. And by doing that with three satellites, we're triangulating our position, which is to me, again, just kind of really impressive that we are able to do that. And all it's sending is time, basically. It's just like, yep, yeah, this is the time it is. So that one's kind of interesting. Now, one thing that people like to use GPS for, how many people have heard of geocaching? Some people shaking their head. All right. Um, one of my favorite lines of geocaching is using multi-million dollar satellites to find Tupperware in the woods. <laughs> all right. So if you haven't heard of geocaching, it's people hide little Tupperware containers, um, ammo cans, giant Rubbermaid containers, whatever the case is, all over the place. Um, and then you use, they give you the GPS coordinates for where that item is, and then you can go try to find it. All right. Um, behind campus, in the, behind the energy house, there's that parking lot kind of like up the hill behind the STEM building. In that parking lot area, there is a geocache for those of you who are curious to like just go find out what it's all about. You know, geocaching.com. Um, it's really funny also to me that you know, people who are really into geocaching, it's, uh, I've, I've heard this story. The, the wife said, hey, you want to go for a walk? It's like, nah, I don't want to do that. And the wife goes, hey, there's geocache down the road. All right, let's go. <laughs> it's, like, it's an excuse for people to get their butts out of bed, 
go find a, you know, a stupid little trinket or box that they can then write their name on and, you know, something to do, not just like, let's go for a walk down the road. So just kind of something different. Next, we have video game systems. All right. Um, Xbox, PlayStation. Those are the two big, the biggest ones. We also have the Wii, uh, the Switch. It's the Switch now. It's not the Wii anymore. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see how they differ. Xbox, PlayStation, they're both basically the same thing. All right. Console plugged into your TV. PlayStation plays PlayStation games. Xbox plays Xbox games. You know, kind of the how it works. Um, the Switch, on the other hand, kind of said, you know what? We want to be different. And the Switch has, it's like a tablet with a joystick built onto it or disconnectable. But then there's also a dock you can slide it in to connect your TV to it. All right. Um, that would be by Nintendo, for those who don't know. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to see how they went for different markets, per se. Um, the Switch tried to do it all, and it does it all okay. The Xbox and the PlayStation tried to do one thing, you know, playing games on the TV, and they both do it pretty stinking well in the long run. Um, and luckily, you have to pick your brand. It's like, do I want to play Switch games, which I'd argue are more to geared towards kids for the most part? Um, or do you want to play PlayStation, or do you want to play Xbox? All right. Now, there is also other video game systems. We now have the Steam Deck, all right, which is by Steam, which is a large video game download website. So you can go buy you know, the games from them. They download it. They'll give you the updates. It's kind of... They're trying to bring all the game developers to one location instead of making you go to individual websites to buy things. Trying to make it simpler. It's like the app store of the gaming world. Um, so they've created their own Steam Deck, which again is a portable device for, for game, playing on the go. Um, and their, their theory is any game you already play on your computer, you can now play on the Steam Deck. Not quite any, but that's kind of the way they're pushing it and they're trying to get to the point, uh, which is kind of nice in the long run. Um, yeah, one thing that you want to consider if you're going to be buying a new video gaming system is backward compatibility. All right, um, I, my parents, I mean, when we were kids, got us a Nintendo 64. Still have it at home. It still works to this day. Every once in a while, when the whole family's there, we still break out Super Smash Brothers, the original, well, the 64 version. I think there might have been one before that, but I, I'm not a Wii fan. Not a Wii, no. Well, the Wii, not a big Wii or GameCube Smash Brothers. They got too complicated. I like the simplicity of the 64. But anyway, um, backward compatibility. It's like you can't take a, a Nintendo 64 game cartridge and shove it into the Switch. <laughs> There's no place to do that. So you do need to be aware of that. It's not like they're always backwards compatible. So something to want to think about. You also want to think about your game controller. All right. Um, most video game systems that are dedicated gaming systems have you know joysticks and you know buttons and analog triggers and things for whatever purpose. Um, and which one do you prefer, or which knockoff do you prefer? I don't know many people that really like the non-name brand joysticks or controllers, but hey, maybe you do. Um, but there's def there's a difference there. The PlayStation has both joysticks kind of right next to each other. The Xbox are separate. They're in different spots. So just kind of something that you got to get used to in the long run. Um, and this leads us into virtual reality. Anyone in here do any VR? One person, maybe. Yeah. I want to get into VR. I, I want to believe in the world of VR. It sounds like so much fun. The little bit of experience is great. How many of you read the book or watched the movie Ready Player One? Yeah, so many of you. If you haven't yet, great book. Uh, I like the book better than the movie. Surprise, surprise, right? But, um, so, yeah. So, virtual reality is an artificial world that consists of images and sounds created by a computer and that is affected by the actions of a person who is experiencing it. That's what that picture on the screen is. That is VR. So, Normally, we are putting headsets on that actually completely block out the real world around us. And we've got a you know, computer screen mounted right in front. And that allows us to see you know, what is in the virtual world that we're exploring. All right. um, up on that screen, I think that's the Oculus. I don't know which version. And then we also have the PlayStation VR in the background. I think it's PlayStation VR based on the controllers. Um, so Oculus, to me, is the big one. There's also anyone know the other big one. I don't remember it anymore. Oculus isn't like the name. It's the go-to right now. And luckily, it's owned by Facebook or Meta now. You used to require a Facebook account to use it. Now you require a Meta account to use it. So a little give and take going on there. Um, but it's it's really kind of interesting if you haven't experienced VR yet. Um, I was wanting to do a VR demo with you guys. And just next year, maybe. <laughs> we don't... <coughs> 
we don't quite have all the equipment set up and whatnot. Um, we actually, I think right before summer hit, we got a whole bunch of headsets. I was like, oh, this would be cool to have, like, be able to let you guys all experience it. And, but didn't work out. Didn't, I, most of them, I think, are still in the box. So haven't been set up, haven't been logged on to or anything yet. So that's kind of a shame. But, um, yeah, so virtual reality. Um, we also do have augmented reality, which is not as well known as virtual. All right. Augmented is augmenting the world around you. All right. How many of you guys heard of Google Glass? Any of you? All right. It was a pair of glasses that you wore that had a little itty bitty screen right here by your, your eye. So you could see like notifications from Google or take pictures on the camera. But then I think they could also like that one might have been able to augment, but. Anyway, augmented reality is actually like a clear see-through headset that you wear that has that are computer screens. So that way when you're looking and I'm looking at all of you, if I had AR augmented reality on, I could have just have your name above each of you. And as a teacher, I would love that. That'd make my life so much easier <laughs> because I still don't know all your names. And I'm sorry about that. I really I hate not knowing your guys' names, but priority list is that's not my priority. It's getting grades graded and things turned in so you guys get feedback. So that one's higher on my priority list. Um, but it'd be really nice to be like, have augmented reality me looking at you guys and be like, oh, okay, that's Joseph and that's Ezra and, you know, whatever. Keep continuing around the room. Um, or have my, my notes going on like an augmented reality so I could see all you guys and not actually have to carry my laptop around and, you know, whatnot. That'd be really convenient, but not the way the game works right now. So, um, yeah, but it's an overlay of the actual world. So physical, virtual over physical. Uh, and it could be such things as like map directions. You're walking down the street, you're like, where do I turn left? And as you look around, which I don't know if any of you have done this recently. Google Maps, if you're walking, you can, there's a button you can press, and it like you scan your surrounding with your phone with the camera, and then it's like, oh, we know where you are, and then it starts like overlaying things on your phone of the world around you. It was, I was I wasn't the one driving, it, someone else was, and I was I hit that. I'm like, what's this button doing? I hit it. And I was like, this is really weird. It's like showing you store names and like what they sell, and I'm like, okay, different, but I like it. You know. Gotta get used to this first. So, but anyway, so that's augmented reality. Um, it's it's growing in, in popularity. Um, it'll be interesting to see in ten or fifteen years as any technology is where it's at and what it's doing and whatnot. In the long run, virtual reality and augmented are still in their infant stages. All right. Um, I think Oculus. There's a video about that. IST one two three or yep yeah it's, it's we're still in our infancy it's the technology isn't really there especially the screens um, a lot of people people with VR get uh, motion sick because when they look left. Right, it should update, and they should, you know, whatever's on the screen should move proportionally to them. The problem is, it doesn't always. <laughs> so then, their brain said, "I've looked this far left, but the video is either lagging or whatever the case is, which just makes their, you know, the what they're seeing and what their body's feeling not match up, and it causes problems." Um, it's really kind of fun to do that with uh, drones too. If you ever see um, drone racing, yeah, they've got the goggles on, so they have the camera on their drone. And there is a reason that when, if you ever watch it, you see them sit there with their head like looking down. There's no reason for them to be looking down, but I think it's almost like a, if I do this, I won't move my head around and look type of thing. Um, but otherwise people start getting nauseous because it's like the drone's moving left and moving right and you're not moving at all. So your video is doing all this crazy stuff, backflips, whatever. I always love doing that to people. Be, I, last job, I'd take people out to the field and be like, okay, we're going to do a drone demo. And I'd be like, okay, here are the goggles, put them on. And they would. And I'd be like, you ready? And they're like, yeah. And I would just full throttle and just like skyrocket in the air and do backflips. And they're just like, holy crap. They weren't expecting that. I think they were expecting me to take, like, take off kind of carefully and do it. And I was like, no, I'm just going for it. <laughs> so that was always kind of fun to do. By the way, there are drone classes here if anyone's interested. I'm the one that teaches them. Surprise, surprise. All right. Um, types and characteristics. So personal computers are meant to be used by a single user, one person at a time. However, we do have multi-user computers, all right? Um, traditionally, this is going to be some sort of server. And a server is a device that provides services to multiple clients featuring centralized resources such as file storage, processing, and security, all right? 
as we've already mentioned in this class many times, the lovely computers that are provided for you in here are VDIs, or virtual desktop interfaces. So that server is actually, what these are connected to, is actually su supplying the processing power, the video, the, the RAM, the hard drive, everything. All right. All this does is this has enough resources to um, send the information to it and receive it back. That's all it's really capable of. So um, just kind of something to be aware of. Um, the size of the server can be scaled to fit the needs of the company. And likewise, um, the cost of the server increases the size of the system increases. All right. So my little one server at home, which is an old Xeon based computer, not really ideal. It's a little bit of a power hungry machine, but I have one little, like it was an old desktop that was, you know, used as a workstation somewhere that someone was selling. So I bought it. I actually bought it for the CD drive. I'm like I can buy this whole tower for $50 off Facebook and have an extra computer lying around, or I can buy a CD drive off of Amazon for like 30. And I'm like, I'll spend the extra 20 bucks and get a whole computer. Never know when that's going to come useful. Um, and now it's my server. So it obviously came useful. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you can go from one little itty bitty computer to a whole freaking server room, which is what you're seeing up here. All right. Um, HEC has a whole server room, not probably as big as this one, but we do have a whole server room um, with a whole battery backup system. And that battery backup system, I believe, can keep those servers around or alive. You ready for this? For a whopping like 30 minutes. That's long. All right. They need about 10 seconds or 30 seconds, something like that. Just enough time to get the generator started, <laughs> basically. So as soon as the power grid goes down here, the batteries are instantaneously on. Like you wouldn't even notice that the power went out because of that. And then the generators instantaneously start. And then once the, the generators are up and running and at a safe voltage and everything's happy, then that power switches over to the generators. Um, and I think when the power comes back on, I think they hang it on the generator for maybe another half hour or something. Um, just in case there are a lot more power fluctuations because they don't want to be constantly starting and stopping a generator. Um, I don't know anyone was on campus yesterday, but we lost power, at least in the, the building attached to this one. That was lovely. It was all of like 30 seconds or a minute, but it was just like teaching, talking, and all of a sudden blackout. I'm like, well, this is great. <laughs> and the lights came back on. I was like, okay, we're good. I was so frustrated by that point, though. I sent my students home. So I was like, it was a bad day. But anyway, um, so servers. Um, yeah, traditional servers are going to be much more powerful than your standard PC because they are there for dedicated tasks. And you could have thousands of people accessing that server at any given point in time. All right. The VDIs that these computers are accessing, look, there's 30 of them in here. All right. That means you have basically 30 computers built into one tower. Think about that. Or one rack, I should say. I don't know how big the, the VDI actually is. So, you know, that's a lot of processing power to have 30 people. And this isn't the only lab that has VDIs. The STEM lab has VDIs. I think the LSC has VDIs. So, you know, there might be 100 or 200 different VDIs on campus that all may be trying to access this one computer, one server at a time. Hopefully there's two or three of them that they're, you know, offloading different workloads to. But I could be wrong. Um, next, we have the client, which is a device that connects to or requests services from a server. So the server is the computer that the clients are accessing. Um, this is going to be extremely common in the business world. In your home life, you're probably the average person doesn't have a need for a server. I am obviously not your average person because <laughs> right. I do have my server running at home. It runs things like my home automation, a file server, um, Plex server, um, VPN connection, uh, Nextcloud, which is a Google Drive alternative for um, having it your hosting yourself, which I haven't started really using yet, but it's there for me to start using it. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Uh, websites, if I have one, I have a website that can do it. So I've got a lot of stuff going on in the background at my house that it comes down to. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, at your house, what you might have is a NAS. All right, that will be your server for your average home user. If you have a need for some sort of server, a NAS or a network attached storage is probably what you're going to have. Um, some of them even actually have like other server capabilities built into them. So they're a small computer, small computer with hard drives on it that you might be able to run things like a Plex thing, a Plex uh, service or something like that on. So it does do kind of double duty, but it's a very small device. So that's probably what the average person would have if they're going to have anything. Random question, but for your home server, are you running Linux? Yep. Yeah, what variation? Proxmox. So Proxmox is a variation of Linux, but it's meant for virtualization and containers. 
And I use it for containers because everything is its own little thing. So when one thing crashes and I can't figure out how to fix it, I just shut that one container down instead of my entire server. And it's actually served me very well over since I've gone to that system. So that's what I'm doing. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, okay, networking. Some common services include internet access, email, file services, backup and storage, print services. I said VDI. Um, before I hit all that. All right, you also have mainframes and enterprise services, and these are used with businesses with massive amounts of data to be processed. All right. Um, if you work for a financial company, they're processing all sorts of you know small calculations. They're going to need a much more powerful computer than a company who's just hosting some files for a website or something like that. So it's again a lot of give and take going on here when it comes to the wonderful world of servers, um, and that's the problem. It's like there's no one size fits all. All right. Uh, this is also why I believe that Linux is one of the kings in the world of servers, is because they are very flexible on what devices they're running on. But Windows is pretty good. Linux is almost better. Where it's like I've got this really obscure piece of hardware. Yeah, you know, I need it. it one very specific purpose. Linux is going to be your better choice. What it comes down to. Um, we also have supercomputers, and these are performing specialized tasks such as weather forecasting, oil exploration, biomedical research, and gene research. So again, lots and lots and lots and lots of heavy processing is really what it comes down to. So a supercomputer isn't anything, I mean, it's, it's a crazy computer, don't get me wrong. Like, its capabilities are crazy. Also, the amount of heat it uses and the amount of energy it uses is also crazy. Um, some server company, I forget who, I think it might have been Google, um, decided, because heat is a big issue with servers, how do we get all the heat that the computers are making out of the building? And someone said, you know what, what if we sink the computers in the ocean, or river, or lake, I forget what it was. But So they literally built a capsule, <laughs> put all their computers in it, watertighted it, you know, had the big internet, you know, fiber optic cable and power cable go into it, and they just dropped it in the water <laughs> for a few years. And, they, you know, the amount of energy they used for cooling was basically nothing, because the water did all the cooling, right? The heat went to the water, the water flowed over it, and it pulled all the heat off, which was great. Um, as like a one-off, I think that's probably a great idea. As something I want all my servers doing is no, because that's going to start seriously raising the temperature of the water that we, you know, these servers are in the point where we can't control that water temperature. What's that going to do the fish life and, you know, all the other fun stuff. So I don't think it's a great idea for a long-term everybody to use it, but as like a little one-off, I think it's actually probably a pretty brilliant solution. Um, but yeah. So supercomputers. And now the last one is distributing computing. Anyone heard of distributed computing before? Someone kind of, maybe. All right. Um, to me, this one is actually really interesting. Um, it is basically is well this is aka grid computing at small scale. But basically it's you donating the time of your computer. Alright. You guys all have computers at home. How many of you guys leave your desktop on 24-7 even if you're not using it? Nobody? I applaud all of you. Thank you very much. Alright. Thank you for helping save the world. My server obviously sits there at idle all the time because it has to, but my other computers in my house aren't. Um but I, years, I just left my computer on the whole time. But basically, distributing computing is saying, hey, my computer is sitting here idle, not doing anything. Do you have something for it to do? And you can donate your computer's idle time to somebody else. All right. Um, so, obviously, there's a lot of companies out there that are doing this. This is almost like Bitcoin mining. Not quite, though. All right. Bitcoin mining, you're processing lots of, again, mathematical calculations, trying to mine Bitcoin, and you're making money off that and also processing transactions of people buying and selling thing that's also happening on your computer. All right, but distributing, so as I, as I have on here, people can volunteer their computer's excess processing power to, pro, to a project such as SETI at home, S-E-T-I at home. Um, so the SETI at home project analyzes radio telescope data to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So instead of having someone, you know, this, this small organization who doesn't have funding to buy large supercomputers, they went to their friends and said, hey, can I use your computer when you're not using it? And they went, my friends and I went, yeah, sure, that's fine. And they installed something. So my computer says, hey, I need you to process this data. I send it out to you. Your computer processes it. When you're done, you send it back to me, and I send you your next bit to process. So it's just a little bit of 
back and forth going on. So it's just me using your computer when you're not actively using it. And when you are using it, my stuff just goes idle. And then once you're done, you know, after five minutes of inactivity or whatever, my stuff starts working again. So it's really using all the resources that we have that people, you know, think about all the processing power that just sits idle. You know, it's like, we really need to figure out, you know, the, the gene mapping for COVID so we can come up with a good thing. Well, if everybody just left their computers on 24 seven, and we all said we're going to help out the project trying to gene map COVID so we can defeat it, that'd be probably like triple or quadruple minimal, the amount of processing power that that person had access to now, because everyone's just like, here, use my computer. Um, and one of the projects, one of the distributing computer ones when COVID hit, I think was actually working on COVID data, um, their servers actually couldn't keep up with the people volunteering. <laughs> They couldn't distribute information fast enough to everybody because everyone's like, yeah, use my computer. Let's fix this. Let's solve this problem. And their servers couldn't dole out the tasks fast enough. So they actually I think, had to buy more servers to then dole out the tasks fast enough to everybody who was trying to help. So kind of a, a fun side note. Why couldn't they just give them the computers that were helping more? Probably data storage size. If you, know, if you have this giant um, database that you need access to, they're not directly yeah. giving access to that. So. That's my best guess, but yeah, that would make sense. Be like, hey, uh, you're now um, a server, so uh, here you go. Um, but anyway, the distributing community is just kind of a really neat kind of topic there. That like, okay, let me let me volunteer myself. Oh, actually, I'm just going to be lazy here. Take my computer. That would be a great question. Yeah. So you know, your computer is sitting there now processing. So yes, you're volunteering your computer time. You're not making the money back in electricity that's being used. All right. So yeah, if everybody would just leave their computer on 24/7 and this would all be processing the uh, what's called the base power load, which is the the power that we you know we as a at a whatever you always use a minimum of this amount of power because of lights on at nights and people who are awake at night and you know whatever. So our base power load would definitely would go up from that a lot. Um, and could our power grid handle it? Great question that I don't have an answer to. California probably not. <laughs> All right. After all, they're rolling blackouts when it's hot because everyone's running their air conditioners. So trying to add all the computers on top of that probably not work well. So, all right. And the last thing we have with this is um, safe and efficient use of technology for you. Not talking about the actual like technology or accessing the internet safely. That's a whole different chapter. But just you using technology. All right. And the biggest one that we have to worry about is ergonomics. And I can actually speak to this firsthand. All right. Um, when I bought my house five years ago, six, yeah, five years ago, um, one of the things I wanted was I wanted a nice desk space. I tinker a lot. I do soldering. I do electrical stuff, laptops, you know, like I want a really nice desk space. So I built myself this beautiful standing height L desk in our basement. And then I didn't want my monitors on the desk because that takes up real estate. So I mounted them over my desk um, and everything was perfectly fine for years. And then COVID hit. And I started working, you know, eight hours a day on my computer in my basement instead of, you know, the two hours a day. And um, I got neck issues. And it was really weird how the neck issues actually came. It wasn't my neck that hurt. I had this, like, searing pain that was, like, down to my arm um, to the point that I actually went to physical therapy to try to get this solved. And um, it turns out, as like, you know, the, went to my doctor, they couldn't figure it out. They, they sent me to the therapy. That didn't help. They sent me to, you know, the next person to get an x-ray done to see if there was something. Um, but along that whole process, at one point said, it could be your neck. And that, like, jumped out at me because years ago I read, and the screen is showing you, you do not want to be looking up at your monitors. Many of you are not used to looking up, like, constantly. You know? Now, if you're a mechanic, whole different story, right? You're under a car looking up at it all the time. So your neck is probably better off than mine is. But, you know, most of us, even sitting at the computers right now, you're all looking down at your screens, all right? Um, so our necks are not used to holding our heads up like that. So when you do that, you strain it. So me sitting at my standing height desk with, I had a chair that came up to my desk height, but I was still looking up at my monitors. Not a lot. It wasn't like I was you know, doing this. But, you know, they might have been up here. So I was just kind of looking up just a little bit, and that screwed my neck up. At least I'm convinced that's what the problem was. No one ever, like, said, oh, yeah, that was the issue. But as soon as that like light bulb went off in my head, I went home and I took my monitors off the wall and I put them back on my desk. <laughs> um, and since then, I still have the problem once in a while, but it's basically gone. So that's good. So, but ergonomics is going to be important for you. Um, also, sitting eight hours a day is not good for you. All right. 
This is where the whole standing height desk thing came from, or the adjustable desks, where you can sit for a little bit and you hit a button, your whole desk will raise up, and then you can stand and work for a little bit, go back and forth with it. So um, ergonomics, though, is, is really, it's about your posture. It's about how you're sitting. Is your chair comfortable? Do you have lumbar support? Um, are your feet touching the floor? If you don't want your feet just dangling there, that's not good. So there's, there's a lot of little nitpicky things here. Um, but you, so this is saying your furniture should be adjusted for the optimal comfort and safety of the user. Now, I'm not saying you need to go home and buy the $300 gaming chair that'd be nice and comfortable while you sit at your desk. All right. But if you want to use that argument to your parents, by all means, go ahead and try. Uh, don't blame me though. All right. I don't want phone calls from anyone's parents saying, my son said he needs a $300 gaming chair. And I'm like, that is not what I said. <laughs> You know, but, you know, it's a little bit more of an argument that you might be able to say that this is ergonomically correct and it's going to help my posture and yada, yada, yada. So something to just kind of think about. Um, the other thing you need to think about with ergonomics is the universal design, design principles. So this is to assist people with and without disabilities designing spaces that are easily accessible. All right. Again, those standing height desks there, the adjustable ones really come in here, here. Come in handy there. Um, but this does also apply to user interfaces. Like how do you click on things and all that other fun stuff. Uh, many of you probably have never dived into the world of command line or terminal, all right? Um, and, man, um, any of you guys know keyboard shortcuts for anything? I hope you all know at least three. Control, copy, copy, cut, and paste. I hope you at least know those three. Control C, Control V, Control X, all right? Um, but, yeah, so keyboard shortcuts. Those save you so much time, all right? If a program is well designed for keyboard use, you will be so much faster with that program, all right? Because um, you, you don't have to move your hand to the mouse, right? You're not spending, not, what, two seconds to go from the keyboard to a mouse, like moving your hand back and forth. If you can just tab and alt and control T and things like that, it's gonna be so much faster to move around that program, so much more efficient. This is why many keys, uh, many programs have hotkeys. Um, I'm using OBS to record right now, and I've set up hotkeys, so if I do Control-Shift-1, it starts recording, Control-Shift-2 stops, and Control-Shift-Backslash is my pause button. <laughs> Alright, and it's just, you know, that way it's easy for me to do those types of things when I don't have to, I don't have the program open. I can see that it's recording, but I don't have the program open to have to deal with that, so. Um, so those types of things are really handy. So keyboards and GUI interfaces, if you don't know what GUI is, graphical user interface are going to be really important for those types of things. So, all right, and that would be the end of chapter one.